And um, Richard yeah. Tai. <laughs> let me just uh, yeah, let me just say real quickly uh, that uh, we're really glad to have Kelly Robinson with us tonight. I mean, I think he'll tell his own story, but Domogoy uh, Malevich and I did projects with him in Croatia in 2007 and 2008 and stayed friends. Uh, and some similar kind of business seminars as this, of course, they were live back then and in person. And uh, uh, so I don't want to steal too much of Kelly's uh, story, whatever he wants to share about it, but we are really glad to have stayed in touch with one another. I slept over at Kelly's house in Western Michigan uh, a couple of years ago when I was driving from Chicago. And I think that helped us to kind of reconnect a little bit. And uh, really glad you took the time for us. Kelly has really, he'll, he'll tell his story, but he's just really lived an amazing life and uh, uh, <laughs> so far and uh, has uh, uh, just a very wide range of experiences to draw on uh, to share with us, but also uh, academic research that he did as part of a PhD program he finished a few years ago. So yeah, Kelly, uh, take it away. Uh, so, well, I appreciate you all for coming, um, thinking that I have something to say. I'm hoping uh, I do and that you'll get something out of this. Um, this picture that you see on the screen is from my last trip, I think, when we were in CSAC, right? Yep. And, yes. Uh, yeah. So it's been about 13 years since I've been in Croatia. I think about you guys a lot. I uh, miss it. So, Thank you. <laughs> and, I, and it would be a lot more fun to be there in person so we could go to a cafe and have some coffee after we got done. Um, I do have some coffee here that I'm drinking because it's still early in the morning for me. And um, or not that early, but it's lunch. Um, and so I'll have some coffee and I hope you got something to drink too while we go through this. Um, come on now. Let me get down here. Oops. Okay. Good old water. <laughs> so what I hope to talk about today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit what is a high reliability organization. Um, and we'll just look at some different uh, key things and how that interacts with uh, a nuclear culture because it is kind of a culture thing and it's also kind of mandates because the impact of errors in the high reliability organizations are very high. Uh, we'll look a little bit into, we'll just touch a little bit on culture versus leadership in an organization. Uh, which one really drives performance in the organization? Uh, we'll look at fixing errors because that's really a, uh, an important part of uh, high performing organizations. We'll talk about hardy and being resilient. What does that mean? What does it look like? And then uh, what does it take to be hardy and resilient? And then we'll take a look at uh, some, I'll try and give you some tips of what can you do if you want to improve and become a little bit more hardy or resilient. Uh, just a little bit on my background. You're right, I, I have a bachelor's degree in nuclear engineering technology. Um, I, right after I finished that, I uh, started in an uh, MBA and I picked up a, a graduate certificate on the human side of enterprise, which is really focused on change management process improvement. Um, and then I just finished this year my PhD in leadership with a focus in organizational management. Uh, I've been working with nuclear power for 41 years. I became a, I qualified to operate my first nuclear plant when I was 19 years old and became a, and got a supervisory job in uh, probably by the time I was 23 or 24. And I've been kind of in a leadership role since then. And it's been a long time, probably uh, what, 1984, 1980, yeah, around 1984, 85. Um, and I've got eight years of in nuclear leadership development. I was actually the fleet lead for leadership development at the at Entergy. Um, and we did a lot of different little things here. And some of the data from my study came out of that activity. I'd like to encourage folks, it's never too late to go out and learn something. And leaders always continuously learn. I didn't get my bachelor's degree until I was 39. I was 45 when I finished my MBA and uh, I, and I uh, just turned 60 finishing up my PhD. So it's been a lifelong journey. And actually it started back in the 80, late eighties when I was on board the an aircraft carrier, the division officer or the department head rather, he brought me into his office and said, you know what, you lack leadership. And uh, so I'm gonna bring this other guy in to, to help you develop your leadership. And if you oppose me, I'm just gonna get rid of you. And, and this guy was very threatening. He was big on it. He liked to remind folks that he had sent people to prison for doing things 
uh, back in his earlier days. Just because I'm easy, I bore easily, there's other things I've done. I've been a, a part of my job. I've been a, a fire industrial fire brigade leader. I was a state of Vermont hazardous materials emergency response technician, high angle rope rescue, um, search and rescue ground team leader doing doing search and rescue operations um, for Entergy Mississippi. So it, when a big storm comes through, like it does down in the south, uh, it, it takes down the grid and you have to bring in hundreds of line workers and construction folks uh, to help you put that grid back together and put the power lines back up. And my job at, back then was to arrange for vendors to come in and set up feeding stations and parking lots to park 400 trucks or whatever we needed to support those line crews putting the grid back up. Um, I'm a certified emotional intelligence coach and I can give uh, different assessments. And uh, like uh, I think uh, Nolan put out, I've been married 37 years. I've got six kids. Two of my kids are from Kazakhstan. Two of my kids are from China and two were actually born in the United States. And we're, as I was telling Nolan this morning, we're actually on our, or about halfway through the process because we're going to adopt one more kid. So let's talk about the problem. What really, what really kind of got me into this discussion here today? Oh, what is it? Turn too many pages, sorry. So what's a high reliability organization? Um, high reliability organizations have a very complex and hazardous environment. So what you think of like nuclear industry, it's, it's, it is a complex piece of equipment to operate. There's a lot of instrumentation and, um, and it's very, it could be hazardous. We've seen that, you know, when uh, the accidents that have occurred around the world, it can get pretty intense. Um, so you have to set up processes and things to make sure that you don't have those accidents. You think about airlines, right? Air, you, you want the pilots to be error free because uh, when they make an error, sometimes it doesn't work out well for you. Uh, we also, so nuclear plants fit in that definition, right? We are very complex. It takes a watch team of probably, uh, we have 15 people at the plant operating in the control room and out in the plant round the clock. Um, and so it's, it's, and they have to be excellent. They have to be performed uh, perform and then they have to be bright. So um, we'll look in this here where our safety culture came from. We'll, and I'll talk to you about the safety culture, but a lot of that came from the military. So you figure the military is in the United States is one of the operates probably one of the largest fleets of nuclear plants. And they've been doing it since the early 60s. And they've never really they've never had an accident. So, so we look at what does the Navy do that allows that? And then how did that culture actually established back then feeds into a current industry today? So the problem, right? In nuclear right now, we're shutting down a lot of plants in the United States. We're decommissioning. And a matter of fact, the place where I work is, uh, on, is uh, 18 months away from being shut down for decommissioning. So why do we do that? Why would we take a perfectly fine uh, power source and shut it off? Well, we have a lot of challenges. Right now in the United States, gas is very cheap, natural gas. And it's interesting to note that in the, on the grid, in the market, electric, electricity market, natural gas actually drives the price of uh, electricity, wholesale price. So because it's real cheap, they can produce it cheap, and we, can't, we cannot be really that competitive. Um, we have gaps in the performance still. And, I, and I, when I say we have a gap in performance, we're ta talking about big gaps. We're talking about little things. But just in the last three weeks, we had, uh, so my company operates seven nuclear plants. We had four of them trip offline. And some of those were human performance errors uh, done during maintenance, uh, just operating and they were people made a mistake and that caused the plant to take, to come offline. Um, the industry, right? So we have a big industry. We look, we learn from each other's mistakes and, uh, and, and they see it's a cyclic performance and we still have a little bit of problem that we're trying to go off and fix. And then, uh, you know, leaders are critical in the drive, all right? It, it takes a good leader to help his folks get better. And um, 
And what does that take in a liter? So I did a study. Hey Kelly, just real quick, is that your plant? Oh, is I'm sorry. Oh yeah. Uh, let me, I was gonna go back one more. So I, I forgot to talk about, it. thanks Nolan. So this guy right here, is, his name's Troy. And Troy, uh, at, when this picture was taken, Troy was a control room supervisor. Now today he's a shift manager. So he's in charge of the plant, uh, especially if they're on night shift and is the main center point of anything that goes wrong with the plant. He's the one that starts making the calls. He just does everything. He owns all the people. Troy is probably one of the finest leaders I've ever met in a nuclear industry. His folks love him. Um, he's very good at uh, uh, making a, an atmosphere where folks will step up and admit to making errors and wanting to fix themselves and improve themselves. And um, he's really good. And, I, and I'm, he's going to have a good career if he chooses to go continue on after we shut down the plant. Um, this picture right here. So when you go inside the containment building, you get to dress up in, in uh, interesting clothing and uh, make it so you don't get any uh, radioactive contamination on you. And so uh, I spent a lot of time here just this past uh, in September in this outfit uh, doing things inside the reactor compartment. Uh, this is the plant I work at. It's Palisades Nuclear Plant. It's on the shore of Lake Michigan. And as you can see, it's very picturesque. It's a nice place to work. It's pretty rural where I am. Um, a lot of fruits and vegetables. It's a nice place. The plant's clean. And uh, so it's sad that we got to shut that down. There's also a question that uh, was, uh, are the are power plants privately owned in the United States? Are, is, I'm sorry, say again? Are the power plants privately owned? In the Some States? are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the Entergy owns the seven nuclear plants. There's Exelon. Um, there's several companies. Some of them are public utilities, and some of them are private companies, or just their utilities. Right. Thanks. And they're trading. I mean, Entergy trades on the stock market, so it's a public utility. Some are private. Um, anyway, so, so when I did this study for my PhD, I really wanted to take a look and see if there was a relationship between leadership emotional intelligence and nuclear station performance. Uh, so I looked at, uh, I had data from 400 mid-level managers and I used 108 people for this study. And uh, <clears throat> so a number of years ago, we did leadership, a uh, three-day leadership workshop where everybody got a 360 degree appraisal done on their leadership. And then they also took the, an emotional intelligence assessment. And then I had the performance because every nuclear plant in the United States gets rated against every other one. So there could be a list of 100 power plants and you're rated from top to bottom. And so you know where you are, whether you're a top quartile person, um, second, third quartile or bottom quartile. And so I figured that a good plant, high performing plant would have great leadership. What do you think? You think it would, would that sound, does that sound like reasonable? I know you can't unmute. Yeah, cool. launcher poll. Uh, so I, I had, the way I put the question was, what do you guess the results of Kelly's study are on the correlation of the EQ scores of leaders and the plant performance? So you can go ahead and uh, vote. And do, do, like, is it positive correlation would be, yeah, high EQ leads to high performance or is it mild or not correlated or, or is it negatively correlated, which would mean that that if you're <laughs> higher EQ or then the plant behaves worse, basically. So, so we've gotten some votes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I thought I was on the track. And so it, it was a lot of fun. And um, and when you see that, uh, I don't want to, yeah, it was a lot yeah. of fun to do. It took a long time. Uh, it took me about three years to get this done. So you sent out like hundreds of surveys basically and then waited to get replies? Well, so I already had the data from these assessments that we did, but I had to get permission from the folks I did the assessments on to use their data in my study. And then you had to yeah. load it into software and run it on statistics software. So it was a big, big to do. All right, so I'll end the poll and so we can share it. So everybody, yeah, yeah, looks good. You see it there? Well, guess what? I hate to tell you this, but you guys are pretty much all wrong. Um, and it's, it's sad too. Um, I got down to, uh, I'm trying to, oh, you're gonna deal with the poll. Oh, I gotta close this, sorry. This is, a, this is new to me, Zooming. 
there we go. There was no relationship whatsoever in the between emotional intelligence and leadership. And actually there was some slight negative correlations, which really kind of pointed towards the better the leadership, the worse the plant perform. And that didn't really make sense either from just thinking in common sense. Um, so here's a little graph about, so uh, that I had for the leadership scores. Plant A is the highest performing plant. Plant F is the lowest performing plant. And there's not a really a, a whole lot of difference between the scores. The heavy dark line are the means. If you look between the first two plants, plant A and plant B, their correlation existed both for that and for emotional intelligence. So you'll wonder what was going on. Well, the EQ scores were funny enough, and I don't want to get too academic on it, but in general, the EQ scores are lower than 75% of all the other EQ uh, test scores that they had collected. And in order to really evaluate yourself and your performance, you really have to have a good, honest look at yourself. And if and emotional intelligence feeds in that ability to be self-aware and, uh, and how to rate yourself on your performance. So if you're not very emotionally intelligent, chances are you can't really judge your performance or somebody else's performance. And I think there's a piece to that here. It is good to know that the emotional intelligence did equate or did correlate to the full the, the leadership model I was using, which tells you that a little bit of higher emotional intelligence indicates that you're a better leader and vice versa. So what does that mean for us? Well, well, so then I had to figure out what else was going on. What else could be going on that would drive performance of a nuclear leadership plant? So in the nuclear industry, we have a lot of highly developed processes um, and rules to follow. And some of that drives the performance. And then we have a thing called nuclear safety culture. Uh, what, that, what I came out to believe is, uh, Eric said, here we have uh, the well-developed processes and rules, and we have organizational culture. And in an industry, we have a thing called the nuclear safety culture, which is really, it's talked about on almost a daily basis. It's assessed. Um, every year, we take a look at it, and even the Nuclear Regulatory Commission looks at it. So safety culture, and here's a unique aspect of it. If a plant doesn't do safety culture well, then there's a good chance that they're going to uh, be held accountable for that. And just recently, uh, some nu a nuclear plant down south got assessed a million dollar fine because they did some retaliation issues. They had retaliation issues and then they lied about fixing something to the NRC. So that's never a good sign. Retaliation, that means uh, when somebody, what does retaliation mean? Okay, so like if I was to bring up a problem to my boss or to my boss's boss, I might get demoted. I might receive a bad performance review because I made I embarrassed the organization in front of other people. It, so it's it's this kind of a revenge. You pointed out a problem. We will we'll get even with you. Shooting the messenger, huh? Yeah, that's right. So um, we really try to avoid that, and we really encourage that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So nuclear safety culture. If you don't recognize this guy, we consider him in the United States and especially in the military, this is Admiral Rickover. We fondly call him the father of nuclear power because it was him developing the, the nuclear program that resulted in the USS Nautilus, the first nuclear powered submarine that really had led to the commercial application of nuclear power and the generation of the industry. It was his drive and his, uh, his, I don't want to say quirks, but his just insistence on certain aspects that drove a safety culture. And we had that even when I was in, so I went in the Navy in the late 1970s and I retired in 1995, that safety culture is still there. And so that safety culture got transferred into the commercial nuclear industry because a lot of folks in the commercial nuclear industry are ex-Navy. The other thing is in, in the, the Three Mile Island accident, there was a big commission and what came out of that was the development of a, of they call it the Institute, Institute of Nuclear Plant Operations. So we have a self-governing or an organization that provides governments and governance and oversight of 
the entire nuclear industry in the United States. And they come out and do assessments at the plants. The first guy that ran IMPO was Rick Ober's right-hand man during the development of the nuclear program. And every person that's run the uh, IMPO since then has been a retired admiral that has been through the nuclear training program. So you can see that a lot of that military culture has been put into the commercial industry. Um, what the what the comes out of that, right? Some of the some of the tenets, right? Leaders demonstrate a commitment to safety through decisions and behavior. So they expect us as a leader, we're going to make good decisions that uh, that maintain the safety of the plant. We have any issue that's that may affect safety and really anything else, it gets evaluated, analyzed, and then you develop corrective actions to fix it so it doesn't happen again. Um, Everybody takes responsibility for their performance. It really is an individual issue. A, um, we have processes drive planning. I used to be, a, I was a work week manager and we plan a work for a, all the maintenance work going to happen during a week. There's work documents. I mean, everything has a piece of paper. Operators operate the plant with procedures. There isn't anything you do at a power plant that you probably don't have a, a, something to tell you how to do it. Uh, continuous learning industry-wide. So if you have an event at your plant that's big enough, you would send that a summary of that to IMPO and then that gets shared out among the whole industry. So everybody in the industry can look and learn from other folks. This really, in uh, 1985, no, what, no, I'm sorry, it was the wrong plant sinking. The Three Mile Island event had occurred previously at other power plants. The same, the same initiating event occurred at other power plants. But at that time, the industry didn't share things. So the Davis, uh, um, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, the Three Mile Island plant wasn't aware that this problem could pop up. And so when it happened to them, they didn't understand it. And that led to the accident there. Uh, the Primary, the most important peer here is people are free to raise concerns without fear of retaliation. And then the uh, communications maintain a focus on safety. We talk, every meeting starts with a safety message. We talk about nuclear safety all the time. It's on video screens throughout the plant. Uh, trust and respect permeate the organization. The only way you really build trust in organization is through well-defined processes and leaders that are make it safe to be uh, to speak up. Uh, people avoid being complacent and challenge existing conditions. The worst thing you can do is get comfortable at a power plant. And one of the things we always encourage is be always have a question attitude and make sure, are we doing the right thing? Is this right? Are we seeing what we expect to see and, and going on? So we're gonna take a little bit deeper look at this. So the link between human re uh, high reliability organization and safety culture, right? They're really kind of this, almost the same. They focus on the same thing, right? Both groups, everybody's responsible for performance. You, there's, a, there's a big focus on error reduction. We have highly de de developed process. Sorry, I can't talk. I'm getting dried out here. There's a focus on correcting errors. Um, we have a process, it's called a condition reporting system. We probably write 5,000 condition reports a year at our power plant. There are some that even are in the 10,000 a year. Uh, people document issues in the plant. I mean, I just wrote a condition report because I had an instructor last week show up to work 20 minutes late. We had to delay the start of training by 20 minutes until we got a different instructor in there. And I wrote a condition report to track that because I wanted to know at some point, do I have a problem in my work group uh, with people showing up late? And do I need to do something about it? Management is heavily involved. Um, we watch everything. Leaders watch what work is going on. I have a requirement and everybody at the station for if you're a supervisor, we have to go out and do six observations every month and document it. Um, I have to do, I have to go out and do an observation on the other supervisors to help them get better. I have to observe other things in the plant to help whoever's working, whatever I go look at for folks to get better and try and find 
gaps in performance or errors somewhere. Um, and if you don't do that, there's consequences if you don't meet your requirements for doing observations. When we were in, we just did a refueling outage back in uh, August and September, and we were required to do one a day. And so folks were, were they're gonna be held accountable for that. Um, high reliability organizations, right? So they have pretty much five tenants. They're highly sensitive operations, just like a nuclear plant. They're reluctant to accept simple explanations for problems. So sometimes you can like, uh, you know, at work, I'll just like, well, the guy was tired. That's really not a good excuse for somebody not doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, you know, like the guy who showed up late, like what happened? He's like, well, I thought I was doing it on Friday instead of Thursday. And I just kind of overslept and I really didn't understand. Well, that's just, okay, that's nice, but I'm sorry, you just didn't show up to work. And that uh, I will probably dock him a few hundred bucks on his bonus this year because it's that important. Um, they have a high reliability preoccupation with failure. So just like in nuclear, we try to think, how can this fail? How can this, and what can we do to make sure that it doesn't fail? We have what we call risk mitigation. We'll identify risk. We talk about risk that if, if a worker is gonna go out and do an evolution and he hasn't done it for three years, that's a risk because he's not really proficient at it. So how do we make sure that he does it successfully? We might send somebody out that's more experienced. We might uh, put in some different, emphasize the procedure. We might have a supervisor go out and watch them. And the last thing they are, they're very resilient. They stay the course and are prepared to, uh, and are prepared for failures and, and fixing them and how to find them. Okay, so let's look at, I have a couple of quotes from the Admiral, right? And here's one thing, right? One of the key points in nuclear and high reliability organization is a questioning. You question everything. Even if you've done this evolution 10 times in the last year, you still, when you go out to do it, is it the right thing? Is there plant conditions are what we expect them to be? Is the outcome, do we think the outcome, is there anything that we aren't aware of, right? Um, ignorance is not bliss. I like this here, uh, you know, cause it's kind of brutal. Uh, you don't go to heaven if you die dumb. So not being knowledgeable and not knowing what's going on is not an excuse and you can actually cause yourself a lot of problems. Another thing here is like learn from others mistakes, right? Um, you can't live long enough to make every mistake. So that's why, especially in the nuclear industry, we send out, uh, we, the, uh, the industry sends out, they call them significant operating event reports, um, just the, and roll ups and we can go out and find what we call operating experience. What did other people do? And how do we, uh, can we avoid doing what they did? Uh, so we talked a little bit about in the high reliability organizations and safety culture, Again, right, the focus is on what went wrong. When I was a work week manager a number of years ago, we have a metric, right? You, how many jobs, you, if you had 100 jobs scheduled to be done during the week and you did 95 of them and five didn't get done, what do you think we focused on? Obviously we focused on the five we didn't get done to try and figure out why didn't we get those done? And I'm a little, I, I'm kind of on the line about this one because you can learn from successes because what did you do right and how do you apply what you did right to the things you didn't do right, as opposed to just focusing on what went wrong. And so the, what I really, so one of the things we're gonna kind of focus on here is correcting errors. It's tough to wanna to do that. How do you make sure you don't make the same mistake twice? Right, you have a laser focus on it. You always are looking at what went wrong and trying to figure out what did, can you learn from it? Um, and the other part of this here, right, is you gotta have workers that are gonna own up to their errors through critiques. Um, if we do a major, major evolutions like a plant startup, a plant shutdown, that crew will step aside one day after the evolution and walk through the procedure and say, what did we do right, what did we do wrong? Um, we run scenarios in our simulator. If you saw that little video clip I, I made outside the simulator. And at the end of every training session in the simulator, we'll have what we call a hot floor critique. 
And we have operators step up like, well, you know, I didn't do this quite right. Or I didn't do this or I was a little slow to do that. And then we're really down in the details. And then we take those things that um, the crew has said and the shift manager takes them and they develop what we call crew focus areas where the crew commits to fixing a gap in their performance. And this, when you look at it, you go, boy, that's kind of nitpicky. Well, uh, here, this is a picture of the Blue Angels. If, you're, if you don't recognize them, um, you think they're pretty skilled at what they do. And again, I watched a video once a long time ago about that. And they have a, after every show, they sit down in a room and go through the show from the start to finish and see where they weren't quite right. And they're, these guys are uh, stamping up and going, you know, I was about a foot off here. Or I was a little slow to get around here. And they're very looking at every little thing. And from the ground as a spectator, you wouldn't know that a plane was a foot off from where you were supposed to be, but it mattered to those guys because their lives, you know, the, um, what we see is that they follow that lead plane no matter what happens. And uh, I don't know how many years ago it was, the Air Force demonstration team actually flew into the ground. The whole team did because the leader made an error, but these guys are trained to follow the leader no matter what. Uh, so it's important that the leader understands what everybody's doing and that he fixes his issues. And then, um, so in addition to that, like we, we, we will, every other training cycle, we have a crew out there, we give them an exam in the simulator. And then we sit down and we probably, the simulator exam goes about an hour, hour and a half. And we'll probably spend an hour debriefing it um, and documenting things and give them a grade on how they pass. And then we identify errors where they need to improve. And we even look at leadership and team effectiveness attributes. But in order to do that, right, everybody has to be comfortable. So if you have a culture in your organization that belittles people for making errors, um, ridicules them, you're not going to get down and dig into the details because people don't want to be embarrassed when they come, uh, when they are in front of other folks. Yeah, let me, let me, uh, uh, we have another poll uh, I'll okay. launch here on uh, um, how do you feel errors are handled in your workplace, Kelly? I think you did a really fascinating job of, you know, we all kind of have this curiosity, like how in the world do they kind of keep from making mistakes? Um, and yet uh, uh, you just kind of took us from the wide perspective, which maybe doesn't work the same way in all of our workplaces, but if you brought it down there to something which affects all of us, I think, which is how do people, uh, what is it like to uh, admit your mistakes in the workplace? So we're asking uh, in this, this question, you know, which of the following uh, uh, like sentences would, do you think would best describe how errors are handled in your workplace? So, you know, really good would be we systematically get to the root causes of errors and employees are ready to admit their mistakes. We often identify errors, but it's not so systematic. It really depends. People would rather cover their mistakes. And then the worst would be like, there's a strong cult, cult, yeah, culture of fear and employees hide mistakes at all costs. So, so we're getting, just, we're we're getting answers all over the place here. So as they come so, in. So um, now you would think that we build a lot of trust and we work real hard to fix things and that it's, we have good leadership. And uh, so I'll just tell you where we are right today and what I'm going, what I've been going through. And I actually had a kind of a heated discussion with my uh, boss yesterday. Um, so we do these observations and the general manager came out and said, you guys are not doing your observations correctly. Uh, you're not focusing on behaviors. You're just doing this. You're doing that. So he's so he gave he put every supervisor at the facility on a performance improvement plan, which can affect your bonus if you don't satisfy it. And uh, so everybody has to do these observations. And the threat is out there that if you don't do these observations and you don't improve your performance on this, your bonus is going to be affected, and it could be thousands of dollars. So there's a the threat out there for that. Well, we've had some uh, exam security in the nuclear industry is very important because you want to make sure nobody cheats. Integrity is is probably uh, is is uh, in the nuclear industry you got to have integrity. Uh, there's just no way around it. So we had some issues with exam and exam security integrity, and they really were non consequentials. We just we made an error in copying. We didn't collate an exam properly, and we had a bunch of those. And the fleet gave us a and um, they told us we had, a, they had an area of concern. So we fixed it. 
Well, the fleet has come back and now telling us, if you guys have another exam issue, we're going to give you an elevation letter, which is a really a big deal because then the vice president of the station has to answer that. And he doesn't really care to do those kinds of work. So, so that has now rolled down the, his displeasure over being put under that, that if we have another exam security issue at the facility, not only will the worker get a week off without pay, but uh, if it was one of my guys, I'd get a week off and my boss would get a week off. So we're sitting here under these threats. This corrective action thing is a two-edged sword. You got to go after it. You got to fix things. But I can share with you that the threats of if you don't do X, we're going to do Y to you really isn't the best way to go do it. Uh, and that's just kind of a sad way of the industry right now, at least in, in the, at my station. Wow. So I always really appreciate your, your honesty, Kelly, <laughs> and the, the results that came in, I hope people can see on their screen was kind of all over, you know, all five answers came in with some people indicating them. So there really is uh, people experiencing a wide variety in, in that here as well. So the nuclear industry is, is I would say that we are up at the top. Um, we do various levels of investigations and we have qualifications that you go through training in order to like the root cause. That's the, that's the most in-depth um, analysis for a corrective action error that you can do. And we have people that get trained and qualified. And then there are people that, I mean, it has to get reviewed by a bunch of experts and stuff like that, just to make sure we drive uh, and we actually get to the root and we actually have uh, corrective actions that's gonna fix it. The culture of fear, um, that's, that's uh, that's just really tough because uh, you, you won't fix things and, and errors keep happening because, and you don't really get to the point. So Deming, you know, if you go way back to Deming and few folks don't know who he is, he was a guy that worked with the Japanese industry back in the 50s, um, that if there's a problem occurring in the manufacturing thing, go talk to the frontline worker because he's closest to the problem and he understands it better than any leader can understand what's going on. If you don't have the culture that makes it safe for these guys to talk up, speak up and tell you what's going on at the thing and say, you know what, I'm having a struggle here. I'm making errors because I don't understand X or Y or whatever. Um, you're just never going to get there and your performance is always going to be mm, marginal. So, um, Thank yeah. All right, I'll take that pull down and yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Oh, I got to stop. I got to close that again. So uh, we've talked a little bit about correcting, right? Process issues are easy to, I, I would say, relatively easy to fix, right? If you have a procedure that tells you to go open this valve and then open that valve and you got to reverse it, if you can find out that and dig down that root cause and get it fixed, no problem. People are messy, okay? They have a lot of things going on in their lives and, um, you know, it, it, it's just, it's hard. Change is hard. People are sometimes very resistant to change. They're, if you don't have the right culture, they don't even want to admit they made an error. And if they can't admit to it, right, you're not going to fix their behavior. We have to do it, right? Because if our unit goes offline, it's a million dollars a day that we cost the company when we're offline. Because we have a contract with the grid to supply X amount of power. If we can't supply it, we have to buy it. To, in order to fulfill our contract. And most likely that money that we have to spend to buy re the, play, the replacement power is more costly than the, what we're, we can produce it at. So it's very sensitive uh, when a unit goes offline. And it's a big thing because when your unit goes off, the entire nuclear industry in the United States knows it because it's reported out through the uh, NRC on a daily basis, what units have tripped off and what hasn't. So, that's why you need to have folks, and we'll talk about this here um, in a, just a few minutes about being hardy, resilient, and being stress tolerant, right? So let's talk a little bit about stress. Let's see, come on, Mr. Computer, let's work here. So here's, I just snagged this survey, all right? Stress for, we all have it. Everybody deals with stress. And uh, I'm not sure how you guys are doing in, uh, with uh, this COVID stuff. Uh, it's very stressful for us because we have to go to work. We have to keep the plant operating because everybody, the hospitals need electricity. Um, 
I have to tell, say that I have folks in my household that are medically sensitive or at risk due to COVID. I, my 13-year-old uh, has already had two open heart surgeries and uh, he's at risk. And uh, so we have to be very careful, but yet I'm still going out in the world and interacting with the people out in the world that I don't know if they're practicing safe things and doing all the things that we uh, expect them to do or not. Um, I know my wife is very concerned about it. Well, everything that comes in our house is either gets quarantined for three days, groceries get wiped down with some kind of antiseptic thing. Um, <laughs> I take my work clothes off at the back door and go take a shower as soon as I come home, just to make sure I don't bring anything to my house. So, so yeah, uh, I'll go ahead and end that poll. So there, well, uh, one more second, I, on scale of one to five, least stressed and most stressed, how how stressed are those people participating in the poll right now? Right now, the the, the leading answer is three, kind of in the middle. So I'll go ahead and... So and just this, this occupational, so this occupational stress is probably one of the bigger, bigger gaps. And out of work, out of that, there's another survey I have right here. They talk about workplace and um, probably 45% of stress in the workplace is due to workload. 30% up of almost 30% is due to people issues. And if you're in a leadership role, that's probably higher than the workload issues because people are messy and they have problems. 20% um, is work life. And then the other one, and then which is probably today is higher is job security because I know in the, here in the States, a lot of people are unemployed right now because of the COVID or they can't work. So that's really stressing out a lot of folks. Yeah, while you're, while you're doing that, we also have a, another poll, which is, you know, which, so kind of kind of similar to what he has on the screen there, which of you, would, and these are all anonymous, whatever you click is is not, I don't, no one sees, you know, who answered what, but uh, um, the greatest source of my life, uh, stress of my life right now is, is it work, relationships, financial, health, or mental or spiritual? So, um, that's a, that's a hard that's a hard one. Um, my job is pretty stressful. Um, and if we make an error in training, it's shouted across the whole organization. Um, so you have to you work hard to be an error free because you just can't afford mistakes. And uh, it's tough because uh, the upper management expects you to fix things. So if you have a recurring thing, they wonder why you can't be an effective leader. Yeah, the... Uh... I'll end the poll so people can see it. Those who were uh, definitely the relationships was the the one that got the most votes. Hmm. I'm not a good relationship person to tell you how to deal with that. So I'm sorry. Relationships are not my thing. Um, so is it? So the question come up: stress, good or bad? Do you need stress in your life? Um, Interesting fact, like if you, a tomato plant, if you grow an in, a plant, a tomato plant indoors and, and you just let it grow and never touch it it, it, it won't do well. You have to go out and they tell you, you have to go out and actually bash the branches around a little bit like they would be outside in order for it to have some stress and become stronger. So there's some aspects of stress that will actually help you get better. If you do weightlifting, right, that's put stress on your muscles and it helps them build. There we go. So um, some stress is good. It can help you drive performance if there's some level of stress that causes you to, to put more focus on it and to drive it. However, there is a breaking point. And if you get too much stress, um, it can lead to some health issues. Some of the things, right, if you're getting way over here on the right-hand side, fatigue, exhaustion, burnout, breakdown, you hear a lot about people getting burned out, uh, depression and whatnot. So what are some of the signs? And I've just got a couple here, right? Uh, if you are really high in stress, cognitively, you could start having memory problems. You could have issues with the ability to concentrate while you're at work. You're worrying constantly. That's kind of a you can say these are kind of things like the dashboard, little warning lights on your dashboard. They'll start flashing to tell you you got a problem. 
Uh, emotionally, you could get moody, you could be irritable and short temper. Um, if I, if anybody, I'll, I'll confess to that one, irritability um, and short tempered. Uh, you could get into some depression and unhappiness. Physically, you could get aches and pains, frequent colds, chest pains, rapid heartbeat. You could eat more or eat less, drink more, drink less. You know, there's a lot of people hide their stress with alcohol or eating. That's not too good. Uh, you can lose sleep over things and you can procrastinate if you get too stressed because you just don't want to start it. So how do you reduce stress? Did you have, Nolan, did we have a poll for that or not? Uh, we did the stress one uh, and the sources of stress, yeah. Okay. Next one we have is about self-awareness. Um, so there's a, a couple of things and we're gonna look at this because you'll see these come up again, right? What can you do to reduce stress? Get a good night's sleep. And that could be hard. So um, one of the key things that I've done, I used to check my email right before I go to sleep uh, and surf the net. Uh, that blue light coming out of your phone actually disrupts your ability to sleep well. So I've actually started putting my phone in the bathroom so I don't have the temptation to look at it right before I go to sleep. And I try to cut it off an hour or two before I go to bed. Eat healthy, right? So if you're, uh, I have a tendency to swing into McDonald's and grab a cheeseburger here and there. Uh, or, or whatever. People bring donuts to work. You know how that is in a work environment. People bring cookies and donuts. So you got to eat healthy. Music is a way to do it. Exercising. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, take a warm bath, read a book. And if you need to talk to somebody, uh, it's not too, it's not um, a sign that you are really damaged if you seek out somebody to go talk to. I just would encourage it. It could be helpful. Um, so how do you deal with it, right? How do you deal with stress? Let's talk about this. So here's the emotional intelligence model I'm trained in. And one of the things you got to be aware is, is to have on high emotional intelligence is self-awareness. What's going on? If I'm in the morning with, my, with the boss man and he starts annoying me by something, I need to be aware of what he's doing and how I'm reacting to it to try and head it off so I don't blow up and, and holler back because that's never good, especially when we got the other superintendents in there, although it does happen. But I'd like to focus over here on the stress management piece. There's three keys out here on the stress management. Uh, they talk about flexibility, stress tolerance, and optimism, right? Flexibility is the adjust, ability to adjust emotions, thoughts, and behaviors to change in situations. So, um, I've been uh, at a power plant when we had a fire alarm go off and we, it wasn't a drill. And so there's a big changing condition. It's highly stressful. How do I deal with that as a fire brigade leader? Stress tolerance is the ability to withstand adverse events and stressful situations without developing physical or emotional symptoms by actively and positively coping with stress. So there's a, there's a piece in there that's learned, you can learn. And some of those tips I just gave you, and we'll look at them again, we'll put them up on the screen. Optimism is the ability to look at the brighter side. Now I'm a pessimist by, by nature, um, but there is a way to look out and be, and kind of look for the better things, right? And we'll talk a little bit again, a little bit about that. And one of the things this kind of leads into is what we call as hardiness. So there's some I want to say they're buzzwords. This is becoming a new thing. And if you look at LinkedIn, there's a lot of new articles popping up about being resilient, being hardy, uh, stress tolerance. Uh, it's almost like, you know, the guys that earn their living being consultants, they have to create new words and build training around it so that they can earn some money because it gets old. Um, You can get very stressed if you were the one that caused the problem. Uh, once in my really younger days, uh, we were running casualty drills, you know, uh, plant errors, and we had to, I had to take a mitigating strategy, and I shut the wrong valve, and it shut off steam to the only operating electric generator for the plant. And so we went dark for a little bit. Wow. Um, dumb error. 
So that was stress because I had to go explain what I was thinking, what I was doing, and uh, why I was so dumb that I went and shut the wrong valve. So there's a little bit of stress. Um, hardiness is a, so what do you think? Five being self-aware. Yeah, so I asked that. We had a okay. self-aware question, but yeah, you know, so okay. people, the, the, the answers are kind of, in, I mean, the good news is most people felt they're on the better side, but a lot of people felt like they're in the middle. So, you know, how aware they are, because you had a, you had a note about that. Self-awareness is knowing what's going on in your body and mind. Yep. Uh, so hardness is a personality trait. Oh, I have to, remember before I go this, this is a picture of a, of, of a right near where I work. It's a South Haven Lighthouse. It's a wonderful place to be um, with on Lake Mission, Michigan. So that's, a, that's something I get to see every once in a while when I go to work. Going down there and sitting there and hanging out is a good stress reduction tool. Okay, so hardness of personality trait, right? It's a person's ability to manage and respond to a stressful ice event with some kind of coping strategy that turns unfortunate circumstances into learning opportunities. So when something happens, it's easy to say, woe is me, the world is ending, as opposed to, okay, this happened, how do I fix it, and what can I learn from it? Resilience is the psychological quality that allows some people to be knocked down by the adversities of life and come back as strong, uh, at least as before, rather than letting the events overwhelm them. Yeah, we were, uh, Domogoy and I were talking earlier with Kelly today about, about even how, what word is best for that in creation. So oftentimes we translate resiliency as ot, uh, which is more kind of like, a little bit more like a resistance. And then we were talking about whether actually the word uh, elasticity kind of might actually capture, because uh, resilience isn't about, I'm going to correct me if I'm wrong, Kelly, it's, it's not just about being unbendable or something. It's about, you know, yeah, how do you get back up when you got squashed? So uh, it's an interesting think of, idea. Think about it like a rubber band, right? You stretch a rubber band out and let go and it pops back into its normal shape. So stress can stretch you out. And if you're old and uh, if you're an old and brittle <laughs> rubber band, you might break if you get stretched too far um, or, or you can snap back. And that's what we're really trying to talk about is how to, how to uh, snap back. How are we doing on time? Okay. Um, mm. So uh, the guy that developed uh, the EQI and has done a lot of work with it has come out with this concept on hardiness. And there's, he calls it the three C's of hardiness, commitment, control, and challenge. And it, these three things go together to kind of create a mindset. So uh, people high in commitment tend to look at a world as interesting and useful even when things are difficult. Uh, pursue interests with vigor, deeply involved with work, and are socially engaged with others. People that like this think they have a purpose in life and in meaning, where low commitment folks have, you know, life is kind of boring and it just kind of happens, and they just kind of wander through life. People high in control believe their actions make a difference. And so if you go to a big LinkedIn, you'll see a lot about finding your why, finding your purpose in life. And this is kind of where you, where you go with that. Um, high control folks say I make a difference in the world. Medium control folks say sometimes I can change the things around me. Low control folks say things just happen to me. Um, people high in, and then less one is challenge, enjoy variety and tend to see change and disruption in life as interesting opportunities to learn and grow. They say, I love change. Medium medium level folks, I like change when I'm convinced it's needed and low challenge folks says, I'm not changing for nothing. Um, so I just like to take, so personally, what does this mean to me personally, right? So I believe in, that there is a God, I believe in him and I believe in his son, right? And what I've been, what I've learned out of that relationship, right? Is one, God knew me before I was born, right? That's, that's what says that in the Bible. And then he also tells you that he has a mission and a purpose for your life. So if you can tie into that mission and purpose and understand that, you get high commitment because you know that you have a mission and purpose in life. And it's, it's ordained by God to go do this uh, work. And when you can tap into that, uh, you become much more resilient. 
Um, the high control mindset, um, I know that I'm going to make a difference. If I'm doing what I'm, my, if I'm on mission and I'm doing what my purpose is, I am going to have an impact on those around me. Uh, I do that. I think I do it at work. I've had several workers come to me and tell me, you know what? If you hadn't taken this job, I wouldn't have stayed here, which is, uh, I, I'm very uh, humbled over that, that they think I treat them well. alone Because those guys are, they, they very, they're a very tight knit team and they help each other out. And that's, you can't ask for better than that. Um, I can have a high challenge mindset because I love change because change comes as a result of knowing God, right? You're supposed to be content all through your life. You're changing and becoming more Christ-like. So you're changing. Um, and, and, and if you're out impacting the world, people around you are going to change and the world is going to change if you're out doing mission and, and, uh, and, and being on purpose. And, and as you go through these things, because uh, you become wiser and more mature and it makes it even, it makes it even harder because you know that there's gonna be, there's a reason for what's going on that you're gonna be able to have a, con, um, you're doing the right thing and you're gonna make a change. So if you wanna go out and develop hardiness and, um, and emotional intelligence, some of the things you can do, right? So here's a, and part of this is a self-awareness, right? Reflect on what is important in goals. Build out a skill area. If you have some skill, go to back to school, go learn something. Uh, just take time out and observe people. One of the, you know, uh, if I could, I'd come and sit with in a cafe with you and we could sit and watch people and see what they're doing. How does it make you feel? Um, and as a leader, Right. As you go through life, if you can, the more your folks can contribute to solving problems and the more you interact with them in a positive way and encourage them, tell them they're doing a great job. It's just going to reap benefits for organizational performance. Um, if you, you look at control, there are some things I have no control over at work and it's useless to fight it. You just might as well just do it. Uh, we try to match worker assignments to uh, their abilities. Sometimes I'll give them something a little bit harder to work on because they need to stretch and grow also. Uh, break down difficult jobs if you need to and make sure your folks got the resources they need. Because sometimes my guys will like to come in here and say, I'm having a problem and they want me to solve it for them. And some days I, I, I'm weak and I'll, okay, I got it. I'll take it. I'll go research this and I'll let you know. Uh, that happened to me yesterday. A guy wanted me to come in and go, well, you, you go look and tell me what it is. I'm like, well, you know, you can go open the process document and the procedure and you want you go look at it and come back and tell me what's going on. And he did. It's, it's, it's just kind of, I got to watch it because I can easily get pulled into solving everybody's problems for them. And then I never get my work done. Uh, for challenge, don't follow a rigid schedule if you can. Uh, try and drive. If you go to work, Take a different way to work. If you eat the same thing every day for breakfast or eat the same thing for lunch, try something different. Just try something new. Do something different. Uh, from the emotional intelligence, I have a book here that has lists 55 different emotional intelligence traits. And from the trait of resilience, here's the things that that talks about, right? Exercise. Um, there's, there's just a wealth of of information out there on that and, and the benefit it is to your body and to your stress. Uh, organize and declutter. If you, if you could see my desk, you'd wonder what the heck I was doing. Um, but organization, so back way back on the Nimitz, uh, back in the mid eighties, I was not very well organized and I stumbled upon, and for me a solution is I got the, uh, what they call a day timer or Franklin Covey planner. And uh, I think that saved my career because I stopped forgetting about things that needed to get done. And today I still use that planner. So I've been using the planner now for 30 years uh, because if I didn't, and I tell my boss and my folks, if you don't see me write it down on here, you can probably, you can probably uh, rest assured that I'm gonna forget about it. I write everything in there. Um, sometimes you can write a diary just to develop self-awareness. Now I'm not a diary person, but I know that if you write down things and whatever you do, it kind of helps to, what was you feeling at the time? How things are working? What did you do? Uh, eat healthy and then develop your purpose and your values. Do you really understand what your purpose in life is and what are your values? 
again, as you know, as a Christian, that's kind of, I almost say it's easier to be a Christian because you get a lot of help there because you understand what your purpose is and what your values are. Um, yeah, let cool. me uh, just, yeah, that, that's, this is kind of the, the real, I think the point that we're going to have time for questions tonight. I mean, in, after, after, uh, but uh, 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 this is the place for people to really think a little bit. Uh, um, maybe you can go back and forth between this and the slide before a little bit, because I'm going to really give people a chance to think about this, like which one of these four uh, um, would you want to consider uh, working on this week? Um, you know, is it is it uh, developing commitment? Uh, there's a control or the challenge or the EQ. I think I uh, I really resonate with seeing how I, I feel like I have a lot of commitment and a lot of challenge in my life, but control is maybe something I can really work on. So I think this is a really good um, breakdown, you know, to help us really take some time to stop and think. So um, while you so. guys are doing this, I'll tell you a funny story. I so I, I took the emotional intelligence assessment and uh, I didn't do very good on it. Uh, I, I, you know, I have some issues with uh, those taking those kinds of assessments anyways. And I brought it home as children and wife. And she's like, I could have told you you were, you were poor in emotional intelligence without having you take that test. I've known it for 10 years or whatever since we were married. So um, I'd like to think that I've gotten better at it a little bit. Challenge is, okay, well, let's go look at that challenge thing. That's, I, I just tell you, you know, um, if you can volunteer for a project at work that's going to stretch you, go try for it. Um, if you want to set yourself a goal, go for it. So um, I'll, I'll share this to you. I used to do, uh, let's see, was it two years ago? Two, a couple of years ago, in our area, they have a series of 5K running races and they call it the fruit belt series and you go to the grape race and you go to the cherry festival and so it's there's a race for each type of fruit fruit that's grown in the area and if you do five of them you get a medallion and a little certificate to hang on your wall because you completed the fruit belt series so i signed up and did it and that was a lot of fun uh, just last year for my 59th birthday i decided you know what running's getting kind of old. So I signed up to do a duathlon because I like the name of it. It's, it was called the Ugly Dog Triathlon. And I just had to go because what a great name. Uh, so that was a, and I wouldn't do the swim part. So I had to do a run, a bike and a run. And um, I was really proud of myself because I was the only person signed up in my age group. And I'm like, I'm gonna get first race because there's nobody else to race against. You can always be a winner if you choose the right race. Three days before the race, two other guys signed up and they're five years younger than I was. And I was, I was really unhappy because those young guys are going to be able to smoke me on this race course. I'm happy to say I did manage to take second place and beat the, one of the other guys out. So you can kind of feel good about it. Um, and I'm looking forward to doing some more of those uh, once we get over this COVID thing. Uh, That's great. So yeah, it's interesting to know the challenge, challenge was a, a clear winner amongst the area people would want to work on. Yeah. So, um, man, try new things, take reasonable risks. What can you learn? I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. There is a learning in everything. You learn a lot more through failure than you ever will in success because you can find out, well, that didn't work right. You know, Thomas Edison developing the light bulb, I don't know, 150, 200 different things that he tried and it didn't work and finally hit it. So um, what can you learn? Well, that didn't work. This, let's try this next time. Again, uh, so oops, I want to get this, wrap this up here. So what I do, right? So at 60 years old, I'm still studying. I've, I've been studying uh, Taekwondo now for five years. And I'm, my goal is to hit, get my black belt as a, in, uh, by the time I'm 65. And I'm hoping I can step it up because I've been dragging my feet a little bit on that one. Uh, it just, it, it helps reset your brain. It just does so much. I can't emphasize it enough. It gives you more energy to deal with things. Um, and so if you can find something to do, just do it. <laughs> just do it. Uh, find something you like to stick with and stick with it. Um, I do a lot of hiking, right? Uh, there are studies out there that shows spending time in green spaces. And I'm not sure how much you got parks in Zagreb. Um, oh, we got parks. Yeah. 
I live uh, in a very rural area and within miles there's hiking trails and stuff to go spend time with greenery. It's very calming and stress reducing. Uh, serving someone. Uh, just this, this spring in May, uh, we had some pretty heavy storms and in the, my hometown where I grew up is about 120 miles from here. And they had two dams that collapsed as a result of that storm. And so because it was my hometown, I went up there and worked with disaster recovery. And um, I was in houses, uh, like I was in this one lady's house, they're in their 80s, their house flooded, their furniture, she had furniture in there to pass down from her dad. They had a, a piano that was built in 1880 or 1890. So this antique, beautiful Steinway baby grand piano, and it had, had uh, was in the flood water. And she was a wreck and she needed a hug. Uh, so we weren't supposed to because of COVID, but it's like, you know, I'm going to just come over here and hug you and take my chances. Um, so going and serving somebody, uh, it helps you get your focus off yourself. And there are people out there in way worse shape than you are. And if you can brighten their day, it's very rewarding. Um, and the last thing here, right, is the faith. Um, again, the Bible tells us we're going to have trials and tribulations. And it's for our development. And so if you can kind of get that mindset, that really helps out dealing with stress and nerve because that helps you focus on what do I, can I learn out of it? Um, it's also a resource, right? If you would don't are struggling with something, you can ask for wisdom. The Bible clearly tells us that we can ask for wisdom and, and we're going to get it. Um, and I think that's helped me be successful in my career at times. And I think it helps me being successful in life. Um, it, it, it's also a big for, source of hope, right? Because you know that it's only a tr it's a trial. It will end at some point. That's your optimism and your tr and your hope that things are going to get better. Um, with that, we can open it up for if anybody has some questions or want to talk about something. Yeah, let me uh, just jump in there. Uh, that uh, we have uh, fifteen minutes left, and uh, um, you can write questions in the chat window. A možete isto pisati na hrvatskom, onda možemo, možemo to prevesti, ako je malo teško ovaj, to složiti, uh, možda na engleskom. Uh, nice, we... no, nice, nice. <laughs> e, hvala, hvala. Uh, and so you can, um, yeah, you, or you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, I also wanted, Domogoj, uh, could you put your... Uh, uh, Domogoj Malovic is the president of Udugra Focus, and I thought maybe you could just, a real briefly, a minute or two, just introduce us a little bit for maybe for people who um, uh, uh, are here for the first time with us. Most people on the call know us, but I just want to be available to say a word, Domogoy, real quick. I am. Yes, I am. Get a little closer. Yeah, you're oh, far away. I'm on the Bluetooth speaker, so I need to bring the speaker closer. Is yeah, there you are. Are. All right. All right. Hey. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> I, I was just writing in the comments. Uh, uh, I guess we forgot we were working so so much with the business people. We forgot to take you up up the mountain. Zagreb. An interesting fact for you is uh, the only capital of Europe that has a World Cup skiing event like right in the city. Like we're literally now a gondola ride, uh, you know, away from the 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 the, the ski slopes. So uh, yeah, we'll show you around in the mountains. You we'll we'll do some hiking. <laughs> So, uh, no, is there something particular you wanted me to share? Or, uh... No, just real quick. Uh, and and uh, at the end, before we go, uh, at the very end, I'll, I'll just, after q and I'll share. There, there is an opportunity for um, uh, for uh, short 50-minute uh, sessions if you want to just uh, ask Kelly anything you want to, you know, meet with him, maybe talk about business challenge or a personal challenge. Uh, I'll put up a survey for that at the, the end of the time. Yeah, and uh, again, I'll share my email address here in a when at the end of this thing, if, uh, if you'd like, and I'll, you know, if you want to email me sometime. Um, the other thing I'll put out here is if there's something that uh, I didn't cover today, you think another or another topic of a seminar, just let, uh, if you don't want to, if you want to let me know or let no one or don't go, I know, um, I'd be happy to do this. I love doing this. I love the, I like, I just said, I wish I could come to Croatia and do this and uh, I'm looking to see how I can do this when, uh, if I retire in a couple of years, I can do this and make more trips. Um, I'm, I, I just can't, uh, 
you know, again, right, the cafe, I love the cafes. I probably wouldn't use the sugar in the cappuccino anymore like I used to, because uh, that's not healthy for me. So uh, it, I was telling, I think I was telling Domagoy earlier, I was in a Italian restaurant in Chicago and I ordered a cappuccino and uh, I took one taste. And I'm like, this tastes just like cappuccino in Croatia and Italy. And they're like, well, that's because it's from Italy. The coffee grounds were Italy. And so it's a very distinctive taste um, and one that you can't get. And now my other complaint here is Americans can't figure out how to make a good foam to save their life. They don't just, most people cannot do it. <laughs> so anyways, that's my grousing for the day. So a question. Kelly, I know, Kelly, I know I've had the privilege of uh, uh, knowing you for a number of years, but uh, I, I, again, it struck me like earlier today when you talked about uh, you know the losses in your life and you, you've lost a daughter and a, and a brother in a span of like two weeks and, and it was a, a, a horrible experience to go through while you had to go back to work. I, I, I wanted to ask you maybe to comment you know some on that and is there understanding in the American culture about this and even more so like what is what is your personal drive of your family to have such big hearts to adopt children from around the world, children with health problems? Uh, and we've talked before when we visited; uh, it was not always easy, and and, and yet you keep doing it. So so so, <laughs> what's the secret? I'm I'm so proud of you. Well, so here's the thing, right? Again, I'll go back to the Bible. The Bible, one of the very clearest things that we have found in the Bible is it has a commandment that says, "Take care of widows and orphans." Um, it's very easy to send a check somewhere. It's much harder to bring an orphan into your home. Um, the first two girls we had from Croatia, or not Croatia, from Kazakhstan, uh, they, were, they had a lot of behavior issues. Um, we had, had to have alarms on doors and stuff. And, uh, and then they, they got 18 and moved out of the house. And then when my middle son went to college, we were home alone as an empty nester. At the time, we had a five bedroom house and my, my wife said, you know, we've got five bedrooms, it's kind of dumb. And so that's when we decided to go to China and bring home the next two. Um, and I, I don't know. And I think we've been blessed because uh, we, uh, we follow the, you know, there's also the command and, you know, it's really the commandment to like, right? You get to understand God owns everything I have. Uh, he owns my job. He, he's he's given me a, a, a level of income and, uh, all I can do is turn around and use that to his benefit and to, and support the mission and stuff. So, and I think because we have been faithful in that, um, even though it's hard, um, I think he's blessed us beyond belief. I don't, I don't, does that answer it? It's very inspiring and challenging at the same time. <laughs> so so I, I admire you. Uh, you well, know. <laughs> We always talk about being on the cut, cutting edge of development and by doing crazy things, if God stimulates you to go do something crazy, um, and like I told the Dom Goy today, so I'm 60 years old, my wife is uh, six months older than I am, and she's 60. Uh, our youngest son is 13. Well, there are 300 kids in the state of Michigan that need a home. So we're going to Yeah. We're, we're going to go get another one. Yeah. Yeah, you're in the process of uh, a local adoption. That's right. We're, we're trying to bring home a 14-year-old, 13, 14-year-old girl. Um, we can't really go much younger because I am old. Um, and I, I don't think I having a five-year-old being, or having a 15-year-old at the age of 70 is a good idea. Yeah. Um, it's going to be hard. If I bring home a 14-year-old that's sports-minded, it's going to be hard to keep up with her and get her what she needs to do. Um, I'm hoping I can get her interested in martial arts so she can we can do that to, as a together thing instead of her playing soccer or volleyball where I can't really compete. Uh -huh. There's a really good question. Uh, if I could, sorry, interrupt. Yeah, go um, ahead. Uh, Bernard uh, Jagar from Focus asked, um, how did your workplace environment and all the stress from a kind of no mistakes policy in the workplace transfer to your marriage and parenting your children? <laughs> Petty um, officer <laughs> Robinson. So, and I'm not sure if he was saying this in jest, but one time when my middle son, I don't know, he was probably 15 or 16, and he came back and said, Dad, you never tell me I do anything right. And I looked at him, I said, I'll tell you what, the first time you do something right, I'll let you know. Um, 
um, I know that I'm, uh, I'm kind of controlling. I'm very critical. We, uh, my wife has a master's degree in intercultural leadership and she's uh, studying certificates in, in trauma and stuff. We are kind of a intense family uh, and high performing because uh, my oldest son has Asperger's. He has an IQ of 150. Uh, the middle son was, was brilliant and he got uh, as not quite as smart as his brother. Um, we've always lived very intensely and very high end and try to, and, and performances, a lot of things in our house, trying to fix what's went wrong. Um, if I'll be quite honest, I'm not really good at marriage either. There's a lot, of, we have a lot of struggles and stress there. Uh, just because I'm kind of cranky work, uh, I haven't really solved the stress at work issues and I bring it home too much. By the end of the day, I'm kind of tired and I'm not, not really up for it anymore. So I'm working on that. I think when I finally uh, got to visit you a couple of years ago, I, I finally met your wife and I started that, that kind of um, cleared up the picture a lot of realizing you're married to a very amazing woman that kind of has, has stuck with you through all this. And you guys really are a very dynamic couple together. Uh, and she's, she's probably sacrificed a lot more in this because she stays home. We homeschool our children. She doesn't work outside her home. She's brilliant. She's very, she's so much better with people than I am. She has a much deeper faith than I do. Um, and I wouldn't be the person I am today because uh, without her, if I would have married somebody else, I don't think I'd be like I am today. So um, I, I just, uh, and so she hates cooking and uh, she's been doing it since she's 12. So, you know, that's almost uh, 50 years of cooking and she doesn't like it. She'd rather be out being a school principal or something. And but she's, this is what she's called to do. So she does it. Kelly, have you had to move much in your career? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, five years ago, we moved up here to Michigan. This is our home state. We moved back partly because her parents are in their 80s and they we need somebody to look after them a little bit. Um, I think that's our 23rd or 24th move since we've been married for 37 years. Being a I was career military, we moved quite a bit for that. Even after I retired, I couldn't, I don't want to say I couldn't hold a job, but I still had wandering feet. I don't think I'm going anywhere else. Um, I love living here in Michigan. Um, there is a, the biggest reason, and here's a shallow, there's a blueberry farm, four or 500 acres worth of blueberry farms within a mile of me. I eat probably two pounds of blueberries a day while it's in season. I love blueberries and uh, you can't get any, Michigan grows the best blueberries in the world. The rural part of it helps reduce the stress. I, I can't imagine living in a big city anymore. It's fun to visit. We go to Chicago once in a while. And feel free to ask a question before we're uh, before our time runs up today. Yeah, I'd be happy. I mean, right. So if you have some, think of something. Um, there's my email address: energy09 at gmail.com. Shoot me, shoot me a question. Uh, I'd be happy to help. I like helping folks. I like helping people work through things. So if I can, I will. Let me then also, okay. So the, uh, there, I just uh, copied a link into the chat. If you would like, again, uh, there's six different slots available in the next 10 days where Kelly said his, his schedule would allow him to spend probably 50 minutes because it would be just a little bit of, um, uh, um, uh, yeah, Kelly, can you type your email into the chat window so people can copy it off of there? Um, and the, the link there that's uh, forms.gle link is a link to the form where you can go. And if you click on one of the options that you would like to meet with Kelly, it'll, it'll actually claim that, that slot. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, and again, uh, Kelly would be happy to talk to you about, about anything um, that, that interests you. Um, uh, let's see, is there a quick, quick one maybe I could ask her. What, uh, um, uh, so you, could you run back just a little bit? Of, so, so, you know, how surprised were you about finding that not the correlation with EQ and yet, and yet how would you express again, sort of why, why you think EQ really matters? Um, if you look, so, I was never a proponent of emotional intelligence. And uh, my first class, my PhD was heavily on emotional intelligence. It was like a light bulb went off. 
Um, and what we used to teach our folks in our initial supervisor course at nuclear was that you could go out and try to learn time management and all these management skills. But if you dig down below, what does it really take to make a good management skill? You find that the emotional intelligence, if you go back, let's see if I can, whoops. If you go back and look at the rest of these things, right? Decision-making as a manager, as a leader, you have to make decisions, but um, can you be, can you resist the impulse to solve the problem yourself? Or can you hold back and let some other folks speak up? Um, you know, interpersonal relationships, how good are you with people? Um, social responsibility, that's whole, I mean, there's just a lot of aspects in here. The stress management, those, those, this is why I chose this model to bring it into Entergy is stress management and decision making. Because if, if those are the two key points here in nuclear industries, you're always under stress because you got to perform and you make a lot of decisions. And sometimes um, you make bad decisions. Like at, at uh, one of the facilities I worked at, the operators in the field came in and said, look, we have a problem with our cooling tower. It's starting to sag. We need to shut it off. Um, and we didn't want to do that because we'd have to reduce power and that would reduce our revenue. And they talked to the cooling tower experts and they said, oh, you guys inspect your cooling tower. You're good. The guys in the field said we were really concerned and they, I don't want to say they got ignored, um, but the experts overrode. So, and then an hour later, the entire cooling tower collapsed. And so now you have, you're on the front page of the newspapers with this big pile of sticks from the cooling tower because we didn't shut it down. Wow. So there's a lot of decision-making going on at a power plant. If you haven't, if some components starting to degrade, do you take the unit offline? Do you fix it? Do you have a mitigating strategy? So there's a lot of decision-making going in. Um, how do you express yourself emotionally? I mean, I've worked for managers that I currently kind of do that blows a gasket and hollers at you. And then I have others that are able to maintain, be calm, speak reasonably and can get through to you. Wow. So, well, that's fantastic. Just, so yeah, um, we could, we could, we could spend hours just talking about emotional intelligence and yeah, and yeah, yeah. Really so works. again, grab, grab one of those slots and you know kelly has both learned very and he's got an incredibly wide experience in life and a lot of deep knowledge on this topic and um and also i'll just say in closing that i think this has been a fantastic example of the kind of thing we really exist to do in, in udrka focus we have a, a motto uh to change yourself to change society where we seek to integrate um uh your your personal your spiritual uh, professional life uh, so that you uh, can find um, a way to be a transformative person. I think Kelly is a great example to those of us who know him of a person who lives a transformative life, both at work and in, in all these other things he mentioned, um, really giving his life away. And that comes out of uh, his faith in, in Jesus Christ. So that's, uh, I think this, this evening has been a great uh, little snapshot of, of the kind of things that we really exist to do uh, in focus. And it's been Really wonderful to have all you with us. Thank you for your patience through, through 90 minutes. And uh, um, yeah, I just, uh, we, we like to honor the time, but uh, Kelly, thank you so much for taking the time for us and working on these slides and going back and forth with me a number of times for, you know, think, asking for input. And uh, this has just been really delightful um, thing to have here in, uh, in the beginning of December when things are dark and we all got shut down and we're not quite under lockdown but the cafes are all closed and it's a it's a tough time so resilience is a fantastic message for all of us right now that uh, we're all being squished and pulled in a lot of different ways but um, uh, there is there is a way um, uh, to get through that and to and to bounce back and so um, you all got emails from me. If there's anything you would like to be connected with somebody here in, in Zagreb about, uh, we have a number of different groups that meet that are focused on business people or reading through the Bible um, on Saturdays, uh, things like that. If you would be interested in, in any of those activities, uh, just uh, reply to my email and I can direct you to some other similar resources. So yeah, Kelly, thank you so much for being with us this time. Thank pleasure. you all of us. Thank you all well, of us for joining real, real us. Real quick, if I may. Yeah, uh, yeah, of I, course. I appreciate you folks coming out and uh, participating and, and giving me, uh, let me kind of wander around for an hour and a half. Um, 
<laughs> I'm, I'm just, uh, I, I hope you guys got something out of it. I hope something today uh, is going to make your life better tomorrow. And that's my whole focus. Amen. Thank you so much. I think, I think conclusion is to have faith. Have, faith, have to yes. have faith. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's conclusion. Thank yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.